Welcome everyone to our next edition of MIT Abstracts. I'm so excited to have you all here. I would like to extend an extra warm welcome to the incredible Nord Anglia students who are joining us today and their wonderful, wonderful teachers. I'm your host, Fatima Hussein, and I'm a graduate student in the MIT Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences. And I am so excited today to share with you the work of the amazing Danielle Olson, um, who is going to join us for today's MIT Abstract and talk about her research and experiences in virtual, artificial, and extended reality. Danielle is totally awesome, and we are just so happy to have her. Hey, Danielle, I see you popped up on the screen. Welcome. So before we get into it, I just wanted to explain what an abstract is quite briefly for those of us who might be new to the series. So an abstract is essentially a brief summary of research that's published, and we're bringing an abstract of an amazing, inspiring person at MIT straight to your screen. So you're getting that snapshot of who they are and all the inspiring work they've done through this series. So I'm really excited to share that with you all. Now it's my absolute pleasure to introduce uh, Danielle Olson. She is uh, an MIT PhD candidate and she's a fellow student like me, but she's been up to some pretty amazing research over the past few years. So I can't wait to share it with you. Welcome, Danielle, how are you doing? I'm doing well, how are you? I'm, I'm hanging in there. So Danielle, you know, I'm not, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret and the Nord Anglia students might already know this, okay? But I'm not actually in a virtual MIT world right now, like you can see. Okay, I'm actually in my kitchen in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So now that you know my secret, where where in the world are you? I'm located in Hartford, Connecticut, which is the capital city of, Har of uh, Connecticut. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, uh, this is really exciting that we're in different places because a lot of the students who are tuning into this call today are scattered around the world. And it's just so excited that we have a, a multi-state and, and multinational community with us today. So Danielle, I'm gonna give you reins of the talk now. I wanna hear about all of your work and all your um, exciting research. So have at it. Sounds great. Thank you so much for having me, Fatima and Mary Kat. Um, and welcome to all the students who are joining us from around the world today. Um, I've been able to connect with the Nord Anglia community in the past, so it's my pleasure to be here. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, as Fatima mentioned, my name is Danielle Olson Getson. I'm a PhD candidate studying electrical engineering and computer science at the MIT Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. And as you probably know, we're going to be talking about imagining new realities today. And we'll, we'll build on what that means in a second. Uh, but before we jump into the technical stuff, I wanted to share a little bit about my background, my story. So I'm originally from Northern Virginia, about 20 minutes south of DC which is the capital of the US. Um, my parents actually met in Cameroon, which is in West Central Africa. So my father was actually, he grew up in a farm in North Dakota. He was a Peace Corps volunteer and he ended up being next door neighbors with my mother. Um, and my mother is an educator. She, uh, while I was growing up, she went to get her uh, degree. She went to grad school. So um, they've always instilled in me a sense of wanting to get a higher education. Um, my mother always said, well, education's the one thing nobody can take away from you and it empowers you. And my father, obviously, as a Peace Corps volunteer, my mom as a teacher, um, they always said, leave the world a better place than you found it. So whatever I wanted to do in life, I knew whatever I did, I'd have to connect it back to making a community or social impact, just because that's always been so near and dear to my heart. So three things that I want you to know about me is that I love to story tell. Um, so I've always loved to read and write stories, verbally tell stories. Um, I love computer science. That's my major in uh, college and may major now. And I'm very involved in social activism. So again, wanting to make the world a little bit better than I found it. In today's talk, I'm going to focus on basically four general topics. The first is my own personal journey into research into where I am today. The second is around what are serious and impact games. Uh, the next is extended reality, as Fatima mentioned. And then last, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I've used STEAM, which you all probably know is science, technology, engineering, art and design, and mathematics to make a social impact. 
So my journey into research started in high school. I was always a lover of languages. I did math, coding, English, and French. These are all ways of just symbolically representing meanings. Um, but I didn't know that STEM was so creative. And it wasn't until I had a mentor through a program called Girls Exploring Engineering, and then later on did a program at MIT called MITES, that I learned that STEM is full of very, very artistic, creative people, um, really, engineering at its core is problem solving. Um, so after I discovered that, I decided that's what I wanted to pursue in college. So I started at MIT after graduation and I initially majored in mechanical engineering, but later on I changed my major to computer science because I wasn't doing very well as a Mechie major. It wasn't something that felt intuitive to me, the way that the classes were structured. I wasn't as excited as I thought I would be. So I ended up deciding to take a leap of faith and change my major. And it ended up being wonderful because I absolutely fell in love with CS. Um, so I, I'm a kinesthetic learner. So I learned through building things and breaking things, which is exactly what the CS education of MIT allowed me to do. While I was an undergrad, I co-founded a nonprofit called Geek, G-I-Q-U-E, which basically educates students like yourselves in uh, STEAM. So everything from building pinhole cameras to uh, embedding electronics into textiles and building you know, fun wearables with that. Um, we ran all sorts of different programs and workshops to inspire and educate children in uh, STEAM. And after college, I worked as a program manager full-time at Microsoft for two years. And in my spare time, I continued to volunteer through that nonprofit. But ultimately, I knew I wanted to go from something more focused on business technology back into something more creative. Because again, as I shared at the beginning, I love storytelling, I love social activism, and I wanted to be able to combine that with my skills and knowledge of computing. So I came back to MIT. I, uh, now build and study computing systems for social analysis and cultural change. Um, and I am specifically working on new ways of modeling identity in video game and virtual reality systems. So this is a quote by Leonardo da Vinci that's always inspired me through my journey, which is that um, rather than focusing on just art or just science, he encourages us to study the science of art and the art of science because everything connects to everything else. And so that's something I, I urge you to think about um, as you move forward after today's talk is how can I take my love of one subject and uh, connect it to a seemingly disparate field? And sometimes that really deepens your love and appreciation um, of that topic. So next up, I want to talk a little bit about serious and impact games. So all of us probably on this call have been exposed to some sort of game in our lifetimes. Maybe you play games with your siblings uh, for fun. Maybe you play games on the computer with you know, friendly strangers from around the world, like other kids. Um, and maybe you've actually played video games in your classrooms where um, when I was growing up, we actually played type to learn. So it was a game where we were learning how to type better. Um, and all of these are you know, very worthy purposes of games. Entertainment was primarily the purpose that many of us think of, but games are going way beyond entertainment these days. It's becoming extremely popular. So we refer to serious games as games that, you know, integrate things like uh, game elements, uh, storytelling ed and educational content, co uh, content for things like training, simulations, cultivating solutions to social issues and things like that. Um, so this is a huge field that's growing. So if you're interested in game development as a career trajectory, potentially, you don't have to only think about games that are, you know, for fun. You can think about games that teach people something new. All right, so quickly moving into what I study and how it relates to games. So what is artificial intelligence or AI anyway? You probably already know this because Fatima told me just how curious and talented you all are. But just to refresh your memory, AI refers to the theory and development of computing systems that perform quote unquote intelligent tasks. So something that may be considered intelligent to a human or to an animal, for example, all sorts of different intelligence out there. And so some examples of AI in action that you all probably have seen on your phones or on your computers is natural language understanding. So if you've ever used Siri or Alexa and you've said, hey Siri, do this. Um, and Siri knows how to understand you. Siri just went off on my, uh, my phone because I said that. Um, Siri is using technology that's based on artificial intelligence. Um, if you've ever used uh, your phone to take a picture of something, 
uh, to recognize an object or an image or uh, recognize a color, that's also a form of AI. Um, in VR, which we're going to talk about next, if you ever use controllers where you're doing different hand motions like grabbing something or crossing your arms or waving, those are all gesture detection technologies. And so we can program different gestures to result in different things in the experience. Um, and last but not least, there's things, well, there's many things I could go on and on, but emotion recognition. So I worked on a project where we thought about um, actually personality prediction through voices, which was very random, but all of these different things enable us to perform what used to be considered only human intelligent tasks. Computers can do those jobs too. So AI is used throughout XR applications for a variety of purposes. And there's so many new ideas that I'm sure you all have. So we'll talk about that later. Um, okay, next up, what is extended reality, XR? Um, so maybe you've heard of AR and VR and even MR. Um, XR is just our umbrella term. It encompasses all of the above. So it describes immersive technologies that include things like augmented reality, mixed reality, virtual reality. And so we can think about XR as being along a spectrum of virtuality. So going back here, I consider it the reality virtuality continuum. So you and I right now are in our physical world, right? I can touch my desk, I can touch my computer, my coffee cup, this is the physical world. I might use something called, if you've ever seen memo, or, um, an emojis on your Apple iPhone, um, you might be making funny faces and you see this little character or avatar representing you that's changing its facial expressions. So I think of that almost like augmented virtuality. It's taking in information from the physical world and it's modifying some virtual representation based on that input. We go a little bit further right on the spectrum and we get augmented reality. So maybe some of you have played this game. My husband loves this game. It's called Pokemon Go. And so Pokemon Go is an AR or augmented reality app. It takes uh, digital information like the Pokemon, the Pokeball, and it overlays it on top of the physical world. And again, we use AI here because we have to use uh, image recognition, object recognition to tether the image to the physical world scene. So we're augmenting the physical world with digital. That's why we call it augmented reality. Uh, the next to the right on this uh, spectrum is mixed reality. So mixed reality is when the physical and the virtual worlds get combined a little bit more. So we can interact and manipulate with both virtual and physical objects a little bit. Um, and it takes sensors could, for example, take information in from the physical world, modify the virtual model. I could touch something in the physical world and maybe that augments the, phys the virtual model. This is an example from a exhibit in San Francisco called the Unreal Garden, which was very exciting. Uh, visitors were immersed in a magical world that blended art and entertainment uh, with fantastical flora and fauna. So basically learning about different animals, different plants, and being able to touch objects and see things change with their augmented reality or mixed reality glasses. And last uh, on the far right is virtual reality. So this is, you're completely uh, in a digital environment. So your physical world is completely replaced with a Im fully immersive virtual synthetic experience. So typically you might have no sense of the physical world in this experience. Um, and so as you can see, these people in this photo are wearing headsets, VR headsets. Um, and this man on the right is playing either a game or a simulation. Um, on the left, you can see that these folks are tethered. So if you notice, um, the woman on the far left is having a cord coming out of her headset and attached to a stand. And so many virtual reality headsets these days are still tethered because they have to have access to really powerful computers to display the graphics. But as you know, things are getting more advanced with technology, we have things like the Oculus Go and the Oculus Quest, which are remote, like they um, are not tethered. So I can pick them up, put it on, and I can walk around without being uh, afraid of walking over a cord and slipping. So some of my past projects have combined serious games, AI, VR, and I just wanted to share about four of the projects and then show a little bit of video about two. So the first one is about um, uh, the Breakbeat Narr Narratives Project, which debuted at the Universal Hip Hop Museum of the Bronx. Um, this was one of my favorite projects I've worked on. We basically wanted to find a way to educate the public from all around the world 
coming to New York to learn about hip hop history from the 70s to the present. And of course, you can go to a museum where you're just interacting with a screen and looking at information, but we thought it would be a lot more fun if you could have a conversation with, with these elementals, which re represent the five elements of hip hop. They're basically like superheroes. And they ask you some questions, you answer the questions, and then they personalize your experience based on your taste in music. Um, so that's really fun. If you're ever visiting the Bronx Terminal Market in New York City, you can visit this exhibit for free. Uh, Microsoft is who we partnered on with this project. Um, another project I got to work on shortly as part of a class that Fox Harrell taught was by the photojournalist Kareem Ben Khalifa, who's fantastic and I learn a lot from. Um, he basically created, they basically created this VR experience documenting stories from combatants of uh, both sides of longstanding conflict. So you get to go into this experience and hear the stories of the, you know, the experiences of these fighters and realize there's so many similarities that uh, connect us as human beings, no matter what side you're on. Um, and that experience did use AI because we were detecting body language and how far you walked uh, in front of people to determine who, who you became up at the end, because we wanted to say the person that maybe you were most cautious about approaching, you become them at the end. You could have been them if you were born on the other side, for example. Another experience I worked on was an avatar creation system in computer science learning game. I didn't build the system, but I got to study how it was used in schools to teach students like yourself coding. Um, and the last topic is uh, basically related to my dissertation work. So there's a game called Passage Home, which is a VR experience that uh, reflects on how students are affected by racial discrimination in schools. So that's been a really great project for me to work on. So really quick, just to share a little bit about the Hip Hop Museum project. Um, as you can see, these folks that are visiting the museum, they basically go up to this huge surface hub. They get to tap the screen to basically answer questions about what music they prefer, and then they get presented with this customized timeline of hip hop history. So we had uh, stories about fashion and how the fashion industry has been influenced by hip hop, stories about social issues and, and civil rights and how hip hop has in, uh, uh, changed that, all sorts of topics, you know? Um, so it's, it was really fun being able to go to the debut of that exhibit and see people that came from everywhere, literally hundreds of different places and um, got to learn something new. Uh, whatever their orientation towards hip hop was. And then of course, the, the project I'm working on for my dissertation um, is a VR experience in which you are playing the role of Tiffany, who's a student who's very high achieving. She loves to read and write. Uh, she wants to be a writer when she grows up. And she, she gets accused of plagiarizing her essay uh, due to an unfair belief about her ability. So uh, you're basically having to try to navigate that situation as best you can by talking to the teacher. Um, and it's being used in a, um, an intervention in Michigan. So uh, this has been a really fun project connecting some of my social interests with computing. All right, so some of the current challenges of XR just to wrap up and, and give you some food for thought about where you're gonna make an impact in this space is that right now virtual reality is accessible via these little things. So if you do have a mobile device, you can purchase something like $10 plastic or cardboard headset to put it inside of and do VR. However, you'd only have three degrees of freedom. So that is, you can't twist and turn and use gesture. You you can only really go up, down, left, right, up, down. And um, it's uh, not six degrees of freedom. And those headsets that are giving you the ability to do all sorts of motion are much more expensive. So we need to get that cost down to make sure that people can participate and create in this medium. Um, the second one is comfort. Um, if we wanna have VR, AR, XR affect our everyday life, we carry these around in our pockets all day, every day. We wear these on our wrists all day, every day. Right now, I don't know that I would feel really comfortable with my really heavy VR headset on. It's not as comfortable. It can hurt people's necks. It also can cause eye strain, fatigue, motion sickness. Accessibility is an issue. So um, Oculus actually released guidelines to encourage developers to do things like subtitling and uh, feedback, direction, customizable controller configurations, um, distance grabbing, color blindness, locomotion options, but we still have a long ways to go with that. Um, social acceptance and norms. If you've ever heard of the Google Glass, a lot of people felt very awkward and uncomfortable knowing that there was a camera recording their interactions with people. So, you know, people stopped wearing those because they didn't want to feel 
uh, you know, kind of outside of the norms of everyday behavior. Um, so we're, there's a long way to go with that. Tethering, as we mentioned, those cords, if you're hooked up to a VR headset to the wall, you could trip, you could hurt yourself, so that's an issue. Um, when you currently have a VR headset on, part of your face is occluded. So if we wanted to do full um, facial recognition stuff, if we wanted to know what your eyes were doing, um, not only do cameras sometimes get embedded in these VR headsets now, but uh, when people are in the room and wanna participate on the peripheries of it, they can't see my eyes, which blocks communication. So there's lots of pro fun problems being solved there. And last, but certainly not least, very importantly, trust and privacy. So if I have extended reality technologies that maybe are helping me cook dinner uh, and they wanna know what ingredients I have in my fridge or what's on my counter, do I want a camera watching my family and me as we're doing our daily lives? Those are questions we need to ask, like do we need to develop trust? Um, how much privacy will we need to have uh, in place to do those things? And so the last but not least, kind of my, kind of my charge to you all is, you know, many of you are on this call because you are passionate about technology, which is absolutely exciting, but we don't want to use tech for tech's sake, right? We have to look at why we want to use the technology, who they're helping, and potentially who they might be harming. And whenever we're coming up with solutions to a cause, we really need to think critically about who's really affected by this issue and how can we bring them in from the beginning through the end to the entire design and development process. So that's called participatory design, and I am a strong believer in that. Um, so my question to you all is, what issues do you care about? Who can you listen to to start thinking about solutions um, from communities that are most affected? And how can technology support problem solving? Maybe not replace existing human solutions, but just augment that process. Um, so thank you so much for listening. And I want to hear all your questions and ideas. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn my slides off. And yeah, let's have a great conversation. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Danielle. We have gotten some undoubtedly stunning questions already from a, a very excited audience, but I want to kick us off with uh, my question since I'm the moderator, I'm going to go first. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, but I, I think that a lot of us might be curious and knowing. Can you tell us about some of your favorite, maybe extended reality experiences? Ah, great question. That's a fun one. So in terms of the ones that I play when I am just bored and especially during quarantine, I've been having a lot of fun playing lots of games. Um, there's a game called Thrill of the Fight, which is a boxing VR game. So I'm really active. I love to work out. I love to like move my body. So this game puts you in the first person perspective of a boxer and you have to basically move your hands and get through a fight. It's a great exercise game. So exercise VR is a big uh, new field. Um, even though the headset gets a little sweaty, which is uncomfortable. Another one I like is Job Simulator. So Job Simulator, basically you're doing a fun job. So you might be working in a restaurant or an office space or at a convenience store, and it's really fun. You're basically having to listen to this robot teach you as if we're in this like almost post-apocalyptic phase and human jobs were a thing of the past and you're simulating a human doing that job. So. Those are two really fun ones, but I, for on a more serious note, um, in my phone, I have an app called the Guardian VR. And so if you have a phone at home and you have access to a Google Cardboard or headset, I'd highly recommend checking out some of the journalism VR apps because they do some incredible reporting, things like um, how do babies develop over time so from birth through um, you know, young adulthood and seeing what they see, like colors uh, changing, et cetera. So I learned a little bit about development and there's a few other topics, but check it out. Oh, wow, that's really exciting. As someone who loves reading the news, I'm absolutely gonna look into that. Um, we have a fantastic question from a Nordanglia student named Rishita. And she's wondering what motivated you to make all of this and learn all of this. She says that she was really inspired by you and um, just wants to know, you know, what got you here in the first place? Thank you for your question. Um, you all seriously motivate me as well. So um, the reason why I do a lot of the work I do with the VR experience that focuses on a girl's perspective in high school is because I care a lot about investing in our next generation. And I think games provide a safe, repeatable environment where people can 
try on new ways of doing things and expressing themselves. So maybe I might be a little bit shyer to try on those identities or problem solving mechanisms if I'm in a high stakes physical world situation. Um, so, you know, I care a lot about giving people tools to live healthier, healthier, more positive lives. And I think, um, you know, there's a lot of research that shows that role playing storytelling can be very therapeutic. And like I said, at the beginning of the talk is storytelling has been one of my passions since I was a child, I used to write stories and uh, print them out on my computer and bind them. I had like the greetings card workshop and made my covers. So my mom still has like all these stories I used to write. And um, I also did journalism in high school. So I always wanted to bring and weave storytelling into my computing practice. So that's really what's motivated me. And I think journalism is one of those fields where um, it's like, can I pass the mic to somebody who might not have a platform already? Um, it's, I think it's about you know, amplifying voices that need to be heard. And so that's what I wanna do as a VR creator or a, a researcher. Got it. And now we have a, another question from a North Anglia student and they wanna know, what are some challenges you've faced uh, while you made all these projects and how did you overcome them? Wow, that's a great, these questions are amazing. You told me they would be, but uh, yeah, great questions. I, um, let's see, I think there's a lot of challenges sometimes in working with people, like large teams of people. Um, I'm so lucky, I get to work with some really, really, fantastic, creative and intelligent people who I get to learn so much from. Um, and sometimes when you're on tight deadlines, right, and you have to build something really concrete by a certain date, um, all of those ideas need to be narrowed down into something really uh, buildable and scoped and realistic. And so some of my challenges have just been around how do we listen better and how do we communicate better so that we, we can all come to consensus and sometimes maybe not consensus because sometimes it's a decision that's made for you and that's okay. But how can we be our best selves and hear each other, learn from one each other so that uh, whatever we build together reflects the best that we can do. Um, so that's one of my biggest challenges. And then I guess another challenge has just been around something that I don't struggle with as much today, but I used to a lot, which is just around confidence. You know, when I was an undergrad at MIT, um, I got to be around like the best of the best, you know, and, and a lot of times I was like, why am I here? You know, I, I don't deserve to be here. And I used to, it's called imposter syndrome. And so it's something where you doubt your own abilities and, and your uh, worthiness of being at the table. And um, over time, thankfully, because I've had great communities and mentors and done a lot of self-reflection that I know like, each and every one of us has something that the world needs. And so our voices matter and wherever you end up, you deserve to be there. And so um, that's something that has really helped me is realizing that I deserve to have my voice heard. I have a unique perspective that can help with building systems. Uh, so that's also helped me overcome challenges. Oh, I really appreciate you sharing that, Danielle. I think that's important for people at all levels of their education from these amazing young Nord Anglia students all the way to people like us who are you know, PhD students, my goodness. Um, now we have a, a fantastic question by uh, a student named Atira and she's wondering, uh, how can XR help people with special needs? Thank you for that question, Atira. Um, there's a lot of exciting research just of one of many organizations. Um, Microsoft Research is actually working on extended reality um, for people with special needs um, to think about accessibility issues. So there's all sorts of different, let's, let's think about what already exists in the physical world. There are all of these talented people um, who are already coming up with therapies and educational programming and um, just all, all sorts of interventions that support that community based on what that community wants. So again, uh, if this is a technology that affects a group, that group's voice needs to be heard, right, um, during, during that process. So there are sorts of, um, you know, practicing, you know, associating certain social cues with this sort of response. So there's a therapy for that. XR gives us, an uh, again, an environment in which we can do that sort of therapy or practice uh, repeatedly in a safe environment. And what's cool about XR, instead of just doing it as a game or maybe a written piece of paper or dyadic, like two people talking, the system can watch me and learn from me. So if I'm noticing that 
maybe um, this student is progressing really quickly, then it can automatically generate new problems that are more challenging. Maybe there's another student that they really excelled here and maybe they're struggling with this topic. Um, so maybe I can give them more questions within this topic and before proceeding to the next one. So problem generation and scaffolding and learning, um, those, are, those are certain things that can be applied to XR um, for supporting people with special needs. And again, just to go back to that topic around accessibility, it's so important that as developers of all sorts of technologies, not just XR, that we think about everyone's participation and uh, and uh, use of the system. So, you know, it's not acceptable anymore to ship something and then ignore this huge population of users. Like we have like all sorts of just different abilities, right? And disabilities. And I think it's incredibly important that we design, especially for our most marginalized users, because oftentimes designing for them results in benefits to everyone. There are so many examples of that. I'll get off my soapbox, but thank you for asking that question and for thinking about those issues. Yeah, that's absolutely so important. And you're completely right. I mean, we all benefit um, by making things more accessible. So I appreciate that sentiment a lot. We have another question from a Nord Angley student who's wondering, you know, do you think XR will become a major part of, you know, school curriculum studies in the future? Oh, so I'm wondering if this question is asked about like teaching students how to use XR, um, you know, to develop in XR, or it's um, XR like games and experiences as part of the educational process. Uh, should I answer it like the latter? Yeah, I think it might be the latter. Okay, cool. Um, I hope so. And that's actually why I think, uh, you know, Google Cardboard and all of, and then these plastic headsets like the Viewmaster are really important today because they are way lower cost. You know, it's great. You know, some of you go to schools where you have access to like the best computing systems and hardware and software. And then there's schools I've taught in which they don't, they only have one co computer or none. Um, you know, I've taught in rural areas that there is zero machines. And so I think it's, again, accessibility is so important and that includes cost and barriers to access. So I'm hoping that over time, as we get the cost of VR um, head, mount head mounted displays and systems down, that more and more students will have these in their classrooms. And I also think that there's a lot to be learned around how does learning something in a spatial environment and in a kinesthetic manner, how does that change the learning process and learning outcomes um, as compared to traditional ways of doing things? So lots of cool research there. We're still learning that because it's not done at scale yet. Um, but I, I certainly believe there's a lot of cognitive science research that demonstrates VR is very promising for learning in the future. Mm, that's really exciting. I mean, I wish I was in in, in grade school all over again just to experience that future that would be really fun um not to say i, I did have a lot of fun still in school for sure um <laughs> uh we have a question from a northern english student who's wondering how do they make you know vr experiences so realistic and so sensitive uh, wow that is that is a question i wonder a lot of times when i go into vr experiences that are just so photorealistic um so there's a lot of investment. These are people, I, I don't do this job, but I thank the people who do of uh, computer modeling and graphics. So there's just so much investment happening in that uh, area. And there's so much advancement in terms of our hardware and software that enables people to be able to model things that, with such rich detail. Um, basically, every time you add another detail to a map, in, in these 3D spatial environments, it's very intense in terms of like processing power and, and things like that and um, memory consumption. And again, I, I'm not an expert here. So uh, somebody who is more of an expert probably will correct me, but basically it's expensive for a computer to be able to compute things that are extremely detailed. But what's exciting is that algorithms are getting better hardware is getting better in terms of our processors and, and things like that. So now we can render things with much more uh, detail. Um, that's why when we go into VR experiences that are based on our phone, you might see like simple polygons, like very, very basic and rudimentary ones, like in the VR experience I created, since that was for phone-based VR. Um, so yeah, they, there's a lot going into that. These days, they think use things like um, the Kinect, like uh, in the experience, the enemy that I mentioned, they use the connect to scan 3D uh, models of people's actual bodies and faces. So when you go in, looking in the eyes of the combatants, 
I mean, it was almost like uh, chilling just how real the people looked because it was based on their real bodies, right? Um, so yeah, very cool technologies out there. That's great. And now we have a student who might be thinking very future forward here. And, and they're wondering how much extended reality should, be, should we be experiencing every day versus you know, the reality right now? So is it possible to experience too much extended reality? That's a, I love that question. And, and this is actually the sort of stuff I think about a lot is um, cultural studies amidst computing. Um, so your thought, your question there, that is a whole dissertation topic. It's probably even beyond a dissertation. So you are thinking into the future. Um, and I love that. Uh, it's really true. You know, uh, how many of you all have, you know, a concept of screen times in your home, right? Like how much TV should you be watching? How much time should you be playing on your phone? Maybe some of your parents actually have that, uh, like a rule in your household of like, you can only have one hour of screen time a day or watch this many uh, movies or TV shows a day. I don't know, um, but that's, that's sort of the conversation I grew up with, which was that um, maybe you guys should go out and get some fresh air, you know, to me and my siblings instead of watching TV all night. Um, so there was this kind of tie between like me wanting to consume more media and my parents wanting me to like get back into the physical world. So I think that conversation's always happened and now we just have new technologies to talk about. But there are different implications of XR and VR, right? Like, you know, everything from the fact that in a fully enclosed virtual environment, it's just sensory wise, things can be much more intense than maybe if I'm just watching it on a screen. And it's not to say uh, movies and TV shows don't have a very strong emotional um, impact on people or even physical impact, but there are studies that show, you know, experiencing something in VR can actually like result in memories and feelings that you're really there. So, um, and it's not to answer your question by any means, it's just kind of the process I used to think through these issues of like, what have we learned about screen time in the past? And then how does that apply to, to today? Um, so maybe some of those fears can be addressed. And then how are these technologies different? And what are the new concerns we need to be thinking about and how can we mitigate them? Right. Yeah, future dissertation topic for sure. So maybe someone on this call will be <laughs> the person who, who cracks that. Um, we have a wonderful question from Caitlin and, and they wanna know if someone wanted to enter the VR field in the future, how would you suggest students get started now in high school or primary school? Caitlin, that's a great question. You know, I like that you said, how can I get started now? Uh, that's what I always say is like, start now, use what you have, do what you can. And the fact that you have an internet connection and that you're calling in today, one, it just demonstrates that you're hungry for knowledge. So good for you. The fact that you have that curious mind and you're asking, you're participating, just demonstrate that, you know, you are ready for, to, to grow and to learn. So, you know, you use that internet connection and you look for free online resources and, uh, you know, seeing like, can I take a little online class or a little tutorial? Uh, YouTube these days has tons of tutorials that are enable us to learn step-by-step -step instructions of building things. So uh, really basically speaking, I, I would say there's things called game jams that are available. It's typically free. You can participate in online. They're, they usually go for like a weekend. Um, so there are probably some kid-friendly game jams out there. That's an environment where you'd be able to participate in building a game in like 24 to 48 hours with support of people online. Um, so I'd recommend checking those out if you can. Um, there are lots of little game creators online from scratch to co-spaces to um, just WebXR tools. So you don't even need hardware to do that. You can actually, if you have a phone and then your laptop, you can start building out uh, games and interactive environments that way. And then eventually, you know, I'd say when you have access, if you can borrow a headset, if you can um, talk to a teacher or something like that, um, eventually there are Unity tutorials. So Unity is the tool I use. There's other ones like Unreal Engine, um, but Unity is a great skill to start learning if you can. There's lots and lots of free resources and tutorials through their website for students. And I believe as a student, you qualify for a free version of the app. So um, yeah, eventually once you get the basics of like game design and thinking about uh, objects and scripts, maybe jump into the Unity stuff and then uh, yeah, go from there. Wow, that's great advice. Danielle, do, does that mean I can jump into it too? If I'm a student? <laughs> 
You and I will be at the next game jam. Hopefully I'll see you there. <laughs> okay, fantastic. That's the plan. Uh, we have a wonderful question from Tia who's thinking a lot about these VR headsets. And, and Tia wants to know, can people with glasses use VR headsets? Tia, this is a great question. So comfort, right? I was talking earlier about comfort and Yes. So every single person in my family has glasses except for me. I wear glasses at night when I drive on the road. I used to drive between Connecticut and MIT, so I'd have to put my glasses on. But when I want my sisters to play VR with me and so I can see them experience the fun of VR, when they take their headset off, a lot of times they'll have little creases or indents in their faces from their glasses because they can't see without their glasses. And so that is something that I think is really important to think about is just like, you know, some people can stand it right for shorter periods of time or even longer periods of time. But long term, we're going to need to be creating solutions that take into account, like, how can I make this comfortable for everyone, glasses wearers and not all day, every day. So there are things like, um, I don't know if you all are familiar with the Snapchat spectacles. Um, I received them as a gift a few years ago, but if you're familiar with Snapchat, they use augmented reality, right? Like you can put a filter on your face, like a bunny or a squirrel or whatever, and it uses augmented reality technology. So they created glasses that have two cameras on them and they just feel like sunglasses and they take into the world around you and they do AR stuff, right? Um, and so that's where I think that the trend is going is that we're gonna be wearing things that look like fashion glasses or normal glasses that are just embedded with sensors, um, even microphones, things like that, speakers. Um, and so that it feels a little bit more you know, comfortable. Got it. That's really relieving to know as, as someone who's worn glasses pretty much her whole entire life as well. Um, so uh, Danielle, we have another fantastic question from a Nord Anglia student. They wanna know, who, who is your role model and why? Oh, wow, that's a great question. Um, you know, I can't think of just one person. Um, I have so many people in my community that just help me be brave and help me um, break barriers in terms of the limitations I put on myself. Recently, for example, Dr. Juan Gilbert, he's a professor uh, at University of Florida fantastic man. He um, helped me think through some of my limiting beliefs around what I want to be when I grow up, when I'm done with my PhD. So, and he's done so much for the Black community in terms of people getting their PhDs in computer science. Um, so that's one person that's recently inspired me. And then there's people, you know, in the U.S. that are creating political change that really inspire me. And there's all sorts of other leaders, you know, um, there's a there's an organization here in Hartford called Hands on Hartford, and they do uh, they connect people with like uh, like limited access to food or food insecurity. They give them access to food. They provide job counseling and training and all sorts of other things. And the, the people at that organization inspire me. So I would say there's not one person, but many people. And I feel like wherever you look in your life, you're going to find somebody that's doing something to make the world better. And that's where I find inspiration. That's fantastic. I, I have to say, I, I feel very much the same way about many of the people around me. And now, Danielle, we've gotten so many fantastic questions. And sadly, we have to answer the last one uh, to make sure that we have, have time. So, uh, you know, one of our, our go-to questions we love to ask is for the future people who are going to work in XR and the students who've just learned about your educational journey and, and your research, and they're thinking, man, you know, that's what I want to do when I'm older. What are the, the good qualities that they should start nurturing now? What do you think are the good qualities of the scientists who work in this field today? Yeah, that's a great question. I think my number one recommendation is to be interdisciplinary. Um, what, number one, XR is an interdisciplinary field. You know, it's taking in all sorts of different technologies and combining them. The, the fact is like without creativity and expressivity, people won't be as excited about VR, AR, XR, et cetera. And so 
um, being interdisciplinary is important and it's not just from an artistic standpoint, it's also from a cultural standpoint. There are questions today around um, navigating challenges and uh, even thinking about is there too much XR, like could, could we get too far away from reality? Those studies take into account social uh, and ethical phenomena. Um, so always thinking about, you know, learning social uh, social science or history, learning about, you know, psychology of humans and looking at lessons learned from mistakes that we've made in technology in the past. So I think it's just so important that we continue to immerse ourselves and stay connected to political, social, ethical issues, because we're not above it. You know, as technologists, this is actually so important because we are affecting the dynamics of the world. It affects everything we do, um, the decisions we make, um, the purchases we make, the people we meet, um, AI, XR, it's gonna be involved in all of those things. Absolutely. Well, Danielle, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for sharing your wonderful insights. Before we uh, properly say goodbye, I just want to remind uh, those with us uh, on, on our MIT Abstract still and the amazing students who have asked such wonderful questions and their teachers that there are more opportunities coming this spring to attend MIT Abstracts and they're going to be covering some very, very exciting topics. Next month, we'll be speaking with uh, Professor Richard Binzel, and he's gonna be talking about asteroids, astronomy, and OSIRIS-REx, which is a NASA mission uh, that was had some heavy involvement from folks at MIT. And then in March, we're gonna speak with John Urschel. He's another PhD student like Danielle and I, and he's gonna be sharing with us his journey through mathematics. So we have no shortage of inspiring people coming up, um, and I'm, I'm really excited to uh, have you all meet them as well. I wanted to take a moment to sincerely thank Danielle for joining us and for sharing her time with us today. Danielle, it was an absolute pleasure to learn about your work and you know, you've really expanded our definitions of, of reality and, and what we can do with it and the things we need to be thinking about. So I appreciate that immensely, Danielle. And I'd also like to take a moment to thank Nord Anglia Education for making this entire series and the MIT Nord Anglia collaboration possible. Um, we really appreciate all of your help and support and, and um, Nord Anglia makes it possible for us to connect such amazing students with amazing, inspiring people like Danielle. Uh, and we look forward to continuing to do that for the rest of this series. So we appreciate that a lot. Thank you so much for everyone who's tuned in and joined us and asked such wonderful questions. I can't wait to see you all next time. So thank you again, Danielle. Hopefully I'll see you soon in person. Sounds good, see you soon. Thanks everybody. Thank you all, goodbye.